Welcome to Let's Get Writing. I'm your host, Katherine Taylor. Let's Get Writing is a show about the processes of writing in all, in all its wonderful forms. You get to meet your favorite authors here. Now, my guest today, well, hails from Newfoundland. He was drafted eighth overall by the Montreal Canadiens in the 1995 NHL entry draft. And he played parts of three seasons for the Habs and played professional hockey for almost a decade. Then we had a change, of course, because this is where <laughs> he takes a really, I guess you'd say a, a right, right, turn, right hand turn. In 2013, he graduated uh, from Mun with an honors in folklore and English. And he proceeded to begin an interesting life in the arts highlighted by acting roles on popular TV shows like Frontier, Letter Kenny, Little Dog, Hudson and Rex. He's even tried his hand at stand-up comedy, public speaking, podcasts, and writing, which brings him to me. I'm going to talk about his new book, Fights, Film, and Folk Folklore. It's his second book, his first book, Tales of a First Round Nothing, was a multiple bestseller, and was well received by fans and critics alike. So I want you to meet my guest and he is Terry Ryan. Come on, Terry, I'm gonna bring you up on the screen. <laughs> it's an honor. There you are. Well, we finally made it. We tried this, uh, we tried to do this a few times. And finally, here we are, Terry, it's a pleasure to have you here. You know, we have something in common. We both have English degrees and uh, honors degrees, I believe you have one as well. Mm. And uh, my degree didn't proceed with hockey. So <laughs> why don't you tell us a little bit, bit about how you made the transition from hockey to an honors student in folklore and what was it? Folklore and uh, English. Folklore and English, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> it was all, none, none of that was planned. Uh, I hurt my ankle or, uh, in 2000 one i believe 2002 i had a pretty bad ankle injury i was playing professionally and i had to get it treated a lot um and by professional i mean in the minors i wasn't in the nhl i wanted to get back but it's tough when i say I had an ankle injury that was career ending people picture that i'm on crutches or something no i had a surgery and it just it, it just made me not quite as mobile and when you're talking about the nhl there's a lot of great hockey players in the world. You know, there's what, 700 people in the NHL, 400 of my position. It's, you know, there's really not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of room for those kind of injuries or setbacks if you're not a star. I was getting going. I, I wish I, I, I didn't get hurt, you know, because mm -hmm. I really would have seen, you know, I, I would have gotten a chance to maximize my potential. That never really happened. But Outside of that, I didn't really know what I was going to do, uh, Catherine. I, I really didn't. I came home. First thing I did was start a youth development program uh, for some disadvantaged youth from northern Labrador called the Breakaway Youth Program. Uh, it was mainly you know, kids that wanted an opportunity, and, and we were it was education through motivation. If they went to school, uh, they got to, you know, we got St. John's Maple Leafs were here then. We went to some mm -hmm. games, the Fog Devils. Uh, so really, I, I didn't really know what to do, and I'd worked – you know, one thing when you're playing professional hockey, especially with the Montreal Canadiens, um, they really encourage you to be charitable with your time, more so than your money. Anybody can donate money. But mm -hmm. so that that basically I had a little bit of a history doing that. And, and I, I, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I did that for a little while. And um, for more reasons than one, I just couldn't run it. We had, we had a small group and uh, it was tough to keep, you know, and you're, kind of living you're you're always looking for you know favors from the government or there's a lot of organizational stuff i and i'm not saying that it wasn't great when i did it but I, I just didn't see that being a career i still volunteer with those with those kids um but I, I i one thing led to another and i realized i had some money there for for lack of a real long and unnecessary explanation in my contract uh, I, I did have some money. I think it was for 15 years, whatever. If I wanted to go to school, I got some of it taken care of. So why mm -hmm. not, why not do it? Growing up, I was really interested in creative writing. Um, I did it a lot actually. And, you know, I, I don't think I real, I don't 
think I let anybody know at the time, at least no close friends. Uh, you know, that culture, I was, I was a jock going to a school that bullies existed. And, you know, I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying I didn't let people know I was writing poetry and stuff. I just didn't. <laughs> yeah, so, well, maybe, maybe it wasn't the thing to do because you, if yeah. I recall from your book, when you were young and kind of al alone and away from family, friends and so on, you yeah. did turn to writing. <clears throat> exactly what happened and i'm an only mm -hmm. child and there, there wasn't a globalization of the internet so i couldn't just go on and facetime my friends you know i was literally mm -hmm. and, and you know if i wanted to talk to them i had to save up money to do that it was a lot of money to be long distance calls um and writing you would you know write letters so i uh, yeah i just i really enjoyed it and it, for for lack of a real long explanation again it was it took care of some anxiety I, mm -hmm. I I was nervous about my hockey career, and it wasn't all bad nerves. I was excited to get it going. Like each game, I look forward to. I really felt comfortable. The more I played, I mean, when, when I was in Newfoundland, I really did, I wanted to play in the NHL. I didn't think it was a possibility. We had a bit of an inferiority complex then. Before the again the internet and all that, you know, I played in national tournaments, and you'd usually play the host the first game, so you'd lose seven to one. Everybody gets a free hot dog, you know, kind of thing. So. That's what I, I, I just didn't think it was possible. And when I went away and, and saw that it was, and I started doing as well as I was doing here against my peers in BC and all over the world, you know, I, I really felt a need to, to yeah, a need to write, write all that I felt unique. And, and my right. dad and mom, when I was growing up, they always, I would say made me, but they heavily encouraged me every night to read or write for 20 minutes. That was all 20 minutes yeah. a night. And we add that up as you're a kid, man. And it really adds up. Right. So I was reading any, could it be Rolling Stone magazine. I did that a lot, right. I had a subscription. Sure. They didn't really care as long as I read and interpreted. And so anyway, when I found out I had the money for school, it was about 2009. I decided to go back. I was a Red Bull rep for a couple of years, nothing against that company. They treated me well. I just didn't want to do it for the rest of my life. I, I didn't feel fulfilled, I guess. And I was really used to hockey was a different world. Like, you know, you work at it and, and, and a lot of it's physical, but a lot of it is mental and a lot of it is gaining confidence. And, 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 and then a lot of that is an adrenaline rush. Like, you know, uh, I think that's what led me to the stand up. And, and a lot of people, I wanted some kind of challenge, you know, you're going out right. there, whether you're in the minors or not, whether it was the Montreal Canadians or the Idaho Steelheads or the Hershey bears or the tri city Americans, I always like going out there and, and you don't know what's going to happen. It's very unpredictable. So you go into the game and it's like, boom, you got to start thinking. And I don't know, there's, there's some level of rut and you're, you're performing for groups of people. Even in junior, I was playing in front of 15, 20,000 fans, some games mm -hmm. and there's TV games, you know, and then you play in the under 18 team Canada. So you always feel like you're in this spotlight and, and I don't know, I, it just wasn't there anymore. So I, I wanted a challenge. I went to school and, I didn't really know, Catherine, what I was going to do. I went in there and I remember I was, I, I just started taking courses because I liked them. Mm -hmm. And when I went to see the academic advisor and I took a lot of anthropology and that, or that crosses over with folklore. Right. So for, for whatever reason, I don't know. I was interested. I, I like the, you know, the, the t traditions and, you know, I, I, societies, communities, and it's always really intrigued me. What makes mm -hmm. people tick in, in, in the history you know, like not just politicians or whatever, like Michelangelo or or um, or, or Julius Caesar, whoever. It is. And when you when you study these people, there's always some level of folklore around it. What, what was happening in the world at the time? What, what were the traditions? What what were the heritage of these cultures? You know, and for whatever reason, I like to read a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I like to to write a lot, but I do like to read a lot. And, and none of it was ever fiction. So I said, you know, why don't I go in and actually read the same things I'm reading, but get credits for them. And really, when I went in to see the academic advisor, she said, um, you know, you're you're only a few credits away from a folklore degree. And I knew the English, I just, that was just an extension of what I've, I'd always done. So I knew I was, she said, you've already got your 12 English uh, credits there if you want them. And I had enough general studies. And I always, I never wasn't going to school. When I played for the Montreal Canadiens, I was always taking a course or two. I don't think people realize that. So when I went to see her, I had like 32 credits. I needed 40, I think, right from Mun and then, or courses. 
And I, I'd already had like a bunch from Washington State University back in the day that transferred. And so then, I mean, this is a long answer to your question, but uh, you know, folklore, English, I went with it and I was, um, I, 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 I was just in, interested. So I, the degree I got because it was the courses I was taking that I was interested in, I had no plan. I just wanted to get a degree. More, again, more to prove people, I don't know why, but you know, I, I felt like a failed hockey player in senses and a lot of people, you know, just all of a sudden now I need, what am I going to do? I, I was, I really <laughs> felt like, like I, I felt like I was in the spotlight and I, I felt like I let a lot of people down and I was just like, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to follow this. And, and I know a lot of people aren't going to think the degree, not that I always feel like I'm under the spotlight, but for a degree there was, I was a first round pick for the Montreal Canadians. And I didn't want to just, I was sick of just pacing through life, the Red Bull job and everything. So that was it. And, and once I did, Alan Hawk was a buddy of mine. And Alan was the lead, you know, he was Jake Doyle and Republic of Doyle and he, and he wrote a lot of it and directed it. And to be honest, that was a, that's what I was interested in. So yeah. honestly, he was going to a hockey tournament in, in Toronto called the Exclaim Cup, the Summit of Arts hockey tournament. And you, it's like you know, Leonard Cohen had a team. I mean, he was coaching at the time. Um, tragically, I had a team in there, Sloan. There was all kinds of, there, there was uh, radio stations from Montreal. I remember there was like 50 or 60 teams and you had to be involved in the arts community. Dave Bedini and the real statics had a, had a squad. So I played because Hawk said, do some background. And if you want to work in the crew on our, on our show, yeah, I can take you to this hockey tournament. We can help each other. And then at that point, this, this would have been around 2012, 13. At this point I was, I, I was aware that the book was going to happen. When the, the folklore and the English really helped me not need to have a ghostwriter. I, I was always a creative writer, but I was kind of nervous about the grammar. I didn't show it to many people. But then, you know, with that, if you want to call it a failed hockey experience, I just I, I grew courage or, or grew balls, for lack of a better way to put it. And I was just, you know, I, I just wanted to try other things and be intrigued and do what I wanted to do. There's always those kind of phases that we have. I had a chance to do it. And and Hawk said, you want to work on the crew in, in Republic of Doyle? And I did. And I mean. I started at the bottom. I, I swear to you, I was, I was AD. I was a uh, production assistant for the most part locations. It's really like jump how high I was literally getting people coffee. I was putting up the tents for the cameras uh, making sure people didn't walk into the shop, cleaning toilets, cleaning up in the lunchroom, whatever it was like people think I just walked in and got a favor done because I played on the Montreal Canadians. That wasn't the case. It was two or three years of that. And I, I happened to be working on a show that Ethan Hawke was working on called Marty and got mm -hmm. talking with him. And at that point, my book was out. So I, it was stages of this. Once my book was out, that gave me a little bit of relevancy. And, and people started, you know, asking me to go on their radio programs. And that paved mm -hmm. the way to do a podcast because, you know, I don't think anybody would have listened if they didn't really know who I was. But once the book came out and people, oh, that's what happened to that hockey player. And I see. And then I, you know started to use those radio shows as a little bit of a platform for my own work. And, you know, I, a, a really longer story, not too long for <laughs> like a better way to put it again. Um, I just, I started, I, I, I wrote and I directed a short film called the stand in and I did get some, some minor roles and things, but I used that as kind of a resume. Cause I said, you can get it on YouTube. Um, I just said, you know, no one's going to give me a major role. They'd be silly to do it. I'm getting into acting in my mid thirties. So, um, I, I did that and I sent it around to directors. Uh, honestly, I didn't even know who they were. Some of them, but it did work out. Justin Oki got it and put me in a show called the fire in the cold season. And around as all that was happening, Jason Momoa, I got to know Jason Momoa and I got the opening scene in frontier. A, lot, a big part of that was having no tooth. They needed a British soldier who was beat up. It was only three lines. <laughs> That's it. Please have mercy is all I had to say. And then as I got to know Jason and I got that role, he gave me a bunch of stunt roles in, in, in Braven, a movie called Braven and a bunch of other stuff. And then, you know, again, I'm not, I'm, I'm saying to you, I'm not like an actor. I, I, I do it on the side. Letter Kenny. It was all great. I've been in things. But now that anybody knows how the industry goes, if you're only an actor, you need to be in a lot of things. It pays pretty well. But, you know, you might get four yes. or five days a year right like like when i was on hudson and rex we, we did all that in a day the episode might be shot over a five or six day period but you know they they want they were going to get your scenes in to save on money and you know I, i'm not complaining i'm just saying i'm not an actor i i do those things on the side <laughs> i have a lot of things going on 
And I think that, to get back to that adrenaline rush, and and I think the sporadic work, you know, the public speaking and the the podcast, I I, I do some stand-up here and there, you know, whatever it might be, the acting. I I like that because it's all spur of the moment, and Mm -hmm. I I don't, I you know, I I, I do have to think about it. I mean, when you get in a role, you have to remember lines and everything, but... When, the, when they say action, I feel the same as when I jumped over the boards to take a shift in professional hockey. That's interesting because I think a lot of people who've been where you were and trying to have to pick up the pieces and find themselves again, mm-hmm. you, when you, ha- you have one thing that you thought you were going to do and you were very good at it, you know, it's not easy. I could see where you could maybe have anxiety over that or how am I going to do this or I'll keep this to myself till... And I totally get the adrenaline rush. I, I mean, any of those things that you do, it kind of would replace that feeling of get up there and do stand up. And I liked in the book that you referred to, to that, like it was like, come on, like just do this or don't do it. You know, just get off the pot and, and do something, Terry. You more or less said to yourself and pushed yourself yeah. to do it. It's very cool. I want to come back to the book because I can tell that you can certainly tell stories. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I want to talk about the book a bit, Terry, so that people can get a feel for it. Now, I am not, I'm going to have to confess, I probably not watched very many hockey games. And when I did, it was, I know, high school. To each their own. <laughs> but your book, I thought, you know what? I got. I have it right here. Here we go. I said, okay, I'm going to read this. And the way you write and the stories you tell, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. And you made it interesting. Um, You know, you really did. If somebody's not a hockey fan, this is still such a great read and a fun read. And so talk a little bit about it. Well, I do really appreciate that because I'm aware of that. And part of the reason I think I wrote the, the, the book in the first place, my first one, I mean, you'd have to ask, my therapist, but I think because it, it, it was like therapy writing it. Um, I, I enjoyed the process. I enjoyed, and, and all the stories in there, you know, a lot of them are, you know, edgy, but they're also, you know, they're pretty elaborate and specific. So I don't ever want to get a detail wrong. So I, I call back my friends. I'm like, look, is this the, this is the way I've been telling it. I've been on the back of a hockey bus for the last 20 years, playing senior hockey or coaching or whatever it might be. And this is the way it happens. So like Mark Hurley or, Zenith Komarniski or whoever, like, guys, is this the way it went down? And then they'll repeat back to me, you know, or, or they might add a detail yeah. that was in November, not May. And I like to, you know, so, so but the point here is that it was great because I'm reaching out to, to talk to all, a lot of my old friends again. So that's great. And then I'm also refining the story. And I tell them a lot, which which is also awesome for my podcast and a lot of other reasons. Right. Um, but, the, you know, I, I, also, there's layers to me, and I always felt that. And, and in the public, I was always known only as a hockey player. And I got to be honest, like I, I really didn't like that. I hated it. And and I, 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 I know of some other guys and, and girls in the same boat. Um, Maggie Connors, for example, a great young hockey player I had on my show goes to uh, Boston College, uh, Boston University. Sorry, great hockey player. You know, everybody knows Maggie is a great hockey player. She's getting, she's working on her master's. I forget what in. You know, so th- those yeah. are big things that, you know, also define somebody. When I was growing up, I, we used to have a, a program here called the Enrichment Program. At the beginning of the year, you would do these standardized tests. And if you finish in the top 1% or 2%, you got to go to a special school once a week. So I was doing that from grade 5 to 9. I was horrible at math and everything, but I was really good at the creative writing part right. and the history because you know, I was into it when I was like 5 and 6 years old. So, like... My dad's a big reader. So, you know, I could always, and I love to write, oh God, short stories and plays and movies. And like, I was doing that when I was five, right? Right. So I, and and as far as the Montreal Canadiens, they always were my favorite team, but like, I loved um, Red Fisher, one of their writers uh, for the Gazette, uh, Montreal Gazette, as much as I looked up to Guy Lafleur, I really did. So like I, I like the whole culture of it. It wasn't just drop the puck and watch these guys play hockey. When mm-hmm. I went to the Montreal Forum for the first time, uh, we were in Montreal for a hockey tournament in Pee Wee. Well, I went to the rink the day before just to walk through it and take it all in. I, I, I was like 12 years old, and you know I wanted to see and take in the Montreal Forum. I wanted to meet the vendors. I, I, I wanted to experience it all. And I've always been mm-hmm. like that. And you know I, I'm good at hockey. But, because I grew up playing it and I have a passion for it. 
but I liked everything that went with it. I, I loved, you know, when I was injured, I was injured a lot in these teams I played for, but I would do the color. I'd work in the radio booth or whatever at it. And I'd come home and, you know, I'd always get the same question, but people, some people would say it very gracious and very nice. And, you know, Terry out too bad, you know, what happened and they'd give me a hug or whatever. And I'm like, well, after a while I was like, you know, too bad, I guess, but I did play in the national hockey league. Like it, it's not like I left here and decided to quit for no reason. Like I got hurt. I played, right? Yeah. I know I didn't play a lot, but I got hurt and there's really nothing I could do about that. So I just figured, you know, I know some of it subconsciously now looking back, I never really admitted it at the time, but it was, you know, I, I, I really love writing and I, yeah. I wanted that as much on display and to define me as the hockey and really, yeah. really like I feel so much more comfortably mentally because I chose to do that. And with it came the, you know, the film and all that. I mean, I talk about all that. This book, by the way, the first yeah. one, they're both memoirs. People think the first one's a life story. It's not quite. They're, they're stories in chronological order because I wanted to include a team that I played on. And, you know, they do kind of follow my life. But if I was to, again, no one would buy my autobiography, really. I'm not big enough like Bobby Orr or Wayne Gretzky. But... Those were memoirs that it's the closest thing to an autobiography really as I'm going to get. The second one, there's stories that happened to me, but, you know, again, I, I just like writing and it was wow. a continuation, right? The fights the, is the physical part of hockey. The folklore really is just some more anecdotes and the film. I wanted to catch people up and the film. You never, you never divert too much from hockey, but I wanted anybody to be able to read it. So I really, that's the best compliment that you can give me is that I'm not a hockey fan, but I like the book that yeah. boom, that, <laughs> makes me feel like I did after I scored a goal. Well, you well you did do it. And I mean, the other thing about you is you have an amazing sense of humor. And that comes through in the book. Like I'll tell you right now, I would never go to sleep in a room and leave you with a magic marker. Because I'm sure <laughs> I would wake up with like a mustache or really groovy eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that would have been me. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think so. And I found those stories were so hilarious. Like the, the few of them that you told, the things you did, I thought, oh, man. <laughs> don't, don't let him loose <laughs> well there was always so a lot of people lead different ways of, you know and when you're in the, the reason i say that is because sports i find you know a, a sports dressing room is really i find it a microcosm of real life uh, the you know and, and when if you succeed at hockey if you make it from midget to junior if you make it from junior b to junior a to pro to the NHL, you will see that the the further you go up, you know, it's, it's the more and more leaders there are on each team. And so you get to the NHL and everybody up there is a role model, right? Like for the most part. Um, so in one way or another, they're all exceptional at something. And when you get there, they've all had to speak, you know, they're all the best players, even the guys who don't score a lot. It's the National Hockey League. They would play around here, rec hockey or something, you know, they would light it up. So They've all had some history of success and you get up there, you got to find your way, but you know, it's, it's leaders and some leaders lead by example, go out there and Saku Koivu when I played there, wasn't the most vocal in the room, but he led by example and he was a good professional guy. Mm -hmm. Shane Corson definitely was great in the room. Like he would, he would always be talking, you know, get, you know, here we go guys is what we got to do. You know, we're here now. And there's all, like, a lot of sayings, you know, empty the tank you know, whatever, you know, 110% every night, whatever you're going to do, but you guys need to be reminded. And then I was a bit of a, a little bit of the first two, but I really, I love it, it. It can, it can give you a lot of anxiety, you know, that life and the uncertainty and there's trades and yeah, you're doing what you love to do, but really it's, it's really not, it's hard. It really is hard. I don't, a lot of people don't want to hear that fans. They think, you know, it's just, it's all rainbows and, and cartoon bluebirds, but it's not, man. It's it's it's, it's a tough life uh, from from the unpredictability to you got to keep yourself in shape. And you know, a lot of people just think how hard it is to diet. Well, you know, we all don't want to be working out every day and, and eating immaculately. And but the re the reward is is a great reward. So, but anyway, what I'm saying is that a lot of anxiety comes with. So I I really would keep the humor going. I I was definitely that kind of guy that would have stories usually with a bit of humor to them and. I, I would I would lead that way, and I, you know, a lot of that's being from Newfoundland. A lot of that's being an only child. I looked at the kids. Again, this is this is why it was the whole game is therapeutic for me for a lot of people. Um, but I looked at my teammates as my brothers, and um, you know, and if you don't, if you're not in a good place mentally, it's an impossible sport 
to conquer. Yeah, and I, I think with any, you know, sort of when you, you get at those levels, two, it's about money. It's driven by money, so you've got to perform. There's a lot of pressure yeah. on you. There's a lot of expectation. There's the bottom line to meet. So I, I get all that. I can I can imagine that it would be stressful, and I think humor, yeah, would be a good way to cope with it. We don't, um, Cherry, I just... I know this is hard to believe, but we don't have a whole lot of time left. I just want to take a minute. If you could just say, tell us the name of your podcast. Is it Tales with JR or, or TR? Yes, it's Tales with TR. And it's it's under the umbrella of the Hockey Podcast Network. Okay. And uh, it's it's really, yeah, it, it's unpredictable, like, like, like myself, I guess. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> I sometimes I go on there alone. Usually I have a guest. It's usually somebody that I came across in the hockey world. Doesn't have to be hockey though. Like Jim yeah. Cuddy, for example, wrote the forward to my first book. He's been on Ron McLean. There's a lot more depth to Ron McLean than than Colin Hockey in Canada. I tell you that yeah. the guy's yeah. one of the smartest people I've ever known. I have a lot of musicians on, uh, and just interesting people. But for the most, because I also, you know, the way it is when you do these shows, you, I'll get people, you know. Hey, Tiara, I got a great guest for your show. Or do you want to be, or, or, or I, I, can I be on your show? And, and that happens here and there. But what I, what I like to really do, because I've come, as you see, right, th it's a journey. And, and you're, if there's one thing I learn in, in, in folklore is that your identity is forever changing. And forever. And, you know, mm -hmm. if, if I look at, you know, there's just so many people and experiences that go into me being me. And that is forever changing and and uh, around me from the, the the people i meet to the the, the sports or the activities that i uh, tend to choose to be involved with my daughter now is 10 years old and she's on the scene she acts as well and she plays soccer and that's getting you know more and more serious every year so or fun and more fun but anyway so i i just find that we're moving along here and i like to keep myself challenged um but the, the the game of hockey, to get back to it, you know why I wrote it and everything, is um, it, it's unique, but it's not. Uh, I think what it is 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 a series of situations that happen in life. It just takes longer. Like for example, for example, mm -hmm. I know we don't have much time. Let's just <laughs> say it's the end of. I don't have to. People, you know, you, there's fighting in hockey. So obviously, the the, the easy example if someone gets cheap shotted on your team, you're running and you fight for them, right? Or but. It could be the end of the game. It could be three to nothing and your goalie has a shutout going, right? And, and stats are a big thing. And you might see a guy, you get the game won. There's only 10 seconds left, right? The other team has the puck, but someone goes down and blocks a shot. And that's that puck coming 100 miles an hour hurts. But, you know, they block it with their feet. And why'd you do that? Well, you know, Bobby was going for a shutout. You know, got to get him the shutout. And, you know, and, and so it's this immediate, you can see I'm an immediate reward there. Like, Okay, this guy just got traded to my team last week. But the way it works is that, you know, you got to pick up for me. And, whereas I might work in a, at a job and be in the same stall next to somebody for 10 years. But I don't know. You know, I, I don't really know. Does he have my back? Does she have my back? If the boss comes in now, are they going to say that I was eating a sandwich when I should have been working? It's just, it's so immediate, right? And it, But all of this happens. At some point, you're going to have to pick up for somebody. Or at some point, you're going to be on the spot. Your, your coach is going to call you in or your boss and say, hey, is Jimmy doing his job? Or, 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 or you know, you, you might have to, you know, you, I had to be, I mean, hockey's fun. But 18, 19 years old, living on your own in Montreal, you got to learn to be responsible really quick. Whereas mm -hmm. in my buddies, you know, that was happening after college for the most part. It's just, I find it, it teaches a lot of life lessons. It's just really accelerated, right? Right. And, it, and there's, there's a lot to unpack there, but. Anyway, that's that's the way I see it. <laughs> well, Terry, I could talk to you so long. I just keep it at a certain length so that I can share it with Rogers TV. And uh, but we can do we can do more. We can do it on my po podcast or back here again. Hey. But Terry, before we, um, I just want to thank you, and I'm just going to hold this book up here again for people so they can see it, check it out. And you're such a great guy. Like you have so much energy and. Um, exuberance for life and uh, and it's it shows in your book and I just want to thank you so much for sharing some of that en energy with me today honestly uh, I really really appreciate it and thank you very much for reading it it's uh, it's an honor to have uh, honestly a lot of the non 
non-typical hockey world, uh, take in my book and enjoy it. So I appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. Have a great day. <laughs> you too.